All right, this is Kerry with Multicopter Warehouse, and we're going to talk about the DJI Zenmuse H20T. Today's webinar is going to be about the thermal features that it has. Next week, we're going to dive in to using it for inspection work, the different tools and how to use them, such as the smart inspection and the, um, I'm losing my train of thought, the software that's built around inspection work, which the H20 has quite a few really cool features. Uh, but today we're going to talk about thermal operations because this really rated its own webinar because there's so much stuff to talk about on here. So I'll take a quick look at the specs. It does have IP44 ingress protection with an operating temperature of about minus four degrees Fahrenheit to 122 Fahrenheit. Although trying to get a thermal reading really won't work below about 10 degrees or so. Uh, once you start getting into really sub-zero temperatures, the thermal camera is going to start having uh, some issues re uh, getting temperatures. And the same thing happens with all thermal cameras. The Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual is famous for that, as well as other FLIR products. So it's not just on the H20T, but thermal in really, really cold temperatures is kind of a problem. The H20T has the three different camera options. It has the zoom camera, which is a 1, 1 over 1 1.7 inch CMOS, 20 megapixel with 23 times zoom. Absolutely incredible camera. Uh, when you see this thing being able to zoom in and read license plates from you know a quarter mile away and being able to really recognize people at you know hundreds and hundreds of feet away it's just an amazing camera the wide angle is a one over two thirds inch cmos with a 12 megapixel sensor and when we're doing like photogrammetry with the camera we're typically using that one as it's a, a wide sensor it's just not high megapixel and the thermal camera is a 640 by 512 at 30 hertz and the thermal camera is, is really really good and both uh, models have the laser range finder which has a range of 3 to 1200 meters so pretty impressive there and a few things to note about oh actually I made a mistake on this slide here because I found out after the fact but the H20T is not a FLIR product it is made by DJI uh, so it's not a FLIR sensor, like a lot of people thought it does. And it doesn't have a few of the FLIR proprietary features. Now, at first I thought it didn't have temperature alerts, but it actually does. And I'm going to show you how to set those up. But it doesn't have MSX. So there's no mixing of the daylight camera and the thermal like you can do on the X-T2 or the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. It has a side-by-side -side feature, but you can't overlay it yet. Hopefully that's something that comes out. Uh, while it does create radiometric JPEGs, they're not the same format as the ones you would get with a FLIR product like the XT or the XT2. So you cannot use the FLIR tools software to do your analysis, but DJI has their own called the DJI Thermal Analysis Tool. And not only are we gonna talk about that, I'm gonna do a uh, live demonstration on how to actually use that to do analysis of your images. And it costs less than an X-T2 by several thousand dollars. So that's definitely a plus on that side. Uh, some of the key features are going to be spot metering. You can see here on this picture that you can select a spot anywhere on the screen and get a temperature reading. And you can set that for either Celsius or Fahrenheit, depending on your preferences. It does do our JPEG, as I mentioned, with the thermal analysis tool. You can adjust the temperature range to show you just the temperatures that you want to see or be, have highlighted. The uh, overlay feature is really a side-by-side, -side, and I'll show you how that works. And there's digital zoom that can do two times, four times, or eight times zoom. And you do have the ability to capture images from all three cameras simultaneously or only one of them or two of them. You, you can mix and match what you want it to capture when you hit the shutter. And there is an isotherm setting. So you can uh, uh, 
adjust your ranges and do temperature alerts and, and some other cool things. So we'll show how all that stuff works as well. Now we'll talk about the color palettes. There's a handful of different color palettes you can choose from. The white hot, black hot, rainbow one, iron red, arctic, bulgurite, hot iron, rainbow two, tint, and medical. And when you click on the palette icon at the top of the screen there, you can see it highlighted in blue, you'll get this pop-up from the bottom of the screen that allows you to change your palette or change your temperature ranges. So on this uh, particular screenshot, we're showing the palettes and so you kind of get a little preview of what that would look like. It's not live from the camera. It's just a, a sample image, but it gives you an idea of kind of what you're looking at when you're changing those palettes. And some palettes are going to be better for some things than others. More often than not, when I'm doing like search and rescue or um, looking for lost, lost goats, which I did recently, um, I'll usually have the white hot on. Uh, as the temperature changes and there's less heat on the plants and, and surrounding areas, sometimes I can move to one of the rainbow ones and that might help highlight a heat source that I'm looking at. So the, the different palettes can be really useful in different situations. There isn't one that's going to work in, you know, that's going to work the best in every situation. You kind of need to try them and see what works best for how you're using it and what stands out best for you when you're running your missions. So it's nice that there's uh, a handful of different options available here. So the split screen mode is just really that. It splits the screen between the thermal and the same type of field of view with the, uh, the RGB camera. So you can see side by side. And this is definitely helpful in a day daytime mission where you actually have enough light to see something on the daylight camera. Or if you have like the Wingsland Z15 spotlight, you can have the thermal image and then you can have the, the daylight image with the spotlight uh, shown there. And if you don't know, when you have the dual gimbal set up with the spotlight and the camera, they track together. So wherever the camera's pointing, that's where the spotlight's pointing. So very handy feature for that. If it's at night and you don't have the spotlight, well, then the split screen is probably fairly useless if it's too dark to really pick anything up on that. Let's talk about isotherm. So that's the second icon when you hit the palette. And this allows you to set a range of temperature. And I'll just go ahead. There's got a little video here of how this works. So I can adjust the cold temperature and the hot temperature. And it's only going to highlight the stuff that's within that temperature range. So this can be really handy in search and rescue missions where you, you can set it to plus or minus, you know, five or 10 degrees of body temperature, and it will make it a lot easier for that color range to really pop out on the screen. <clears throat> if you're doing inspection work, utility things, you would probably set that within the specs of whatever you're shooting. So if you're doing like a power line transformer and you really need to know if it's outside of specifications, like it's running way too hot, but then you'd set that hot side to either below that threshold and then it's going to light up like this if it's outside of that, or you could set it for within the range of spec and so there's a number of different things that you can do to uh, play around with the isotherm and get it dialed in exactly what you how you want. But it is a super, super handy feature that can really help highlight those things that you're looking for. Let's see here, go to the next slide, please. There we go. Okay. Ah. Oh, there we go. One, one too many. So the temperature box is another pretty cool feature where you can draw a box on the, right on the screen. You just drag a box along. And inside the box, what you see is the red and blue dots, the red being the hottest spot in that frame and the blue being the coldest spot in the frame. And if you look 
just off to the left, right underneath where the, you select the wide angle camera, you can see that the average there is 36.9 degrees Fahrenheit, which there's no way this was accurate at the time. Um, something that got a little messed up there, but the, oh man, what is going on here? It's showing a maximum temperature of 126 and a minimum of negative 44. So that wasn't correct. Uh, it was probably just because I did it super fast and it didn't have time to quite calibrate yet. So, but this will, we're also going to use this temperature box when we get to doing alerts. So if you look at that box again, where the maximum and minimum temperature are, there's a grayed out one that says 122 degrees Fahrenheit with a bell icon. That is the temperature alert that it's going to look for. But right now, this is disabled. So we're not doing alerts at this point. So we can see that visually just by looking at the screen. So, but we will get to the alerts right now. So how this works is you select an area that you want it to basically focus on. And when it finds a temperature within that, you know, with, within that temperature, at that temperature that you've selected, you'll get an alert. So right now I have it set to 88 degrees. And this is being weird today. Let's go ahead and play this. So I'm gonna expand that box by clicking the icon in the upper left-hand corner. So it takes up most of the screen. And as I move the camera, you can't hear it, but it started beeping quite loudly. If I turn it up, I'm gonna get echo from my screen. So that's not gonna to work too well, but it'll beep, 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 beep. So you know audibly that it was in that temperature range. So again, for a search and rescue, you would set that temperature range right about body temperature. And if that temperature comes into the screen, then it will alert you. So can make flying rescue and search missions a lot easier because you're, you're getting this another point of feedback that can help tell you that there's something on screen that you should be paying attention to. Now to set this, we go into our menu options under the little uh, wrench icon, go to temperature alert, and we're gonna set the threshold. So that's gonna be the minimum temperature that's going to set off the alarm, and we're just going to enable it. So pretty simple to get this turned on. Now, if you are using an H20T today, and I today, and you go in to your menu options here and you don't see some of these settings like scene, gain mode, temperature alert, auto FFC. If you're not seeing those, yeah, this is a bug in the pilot app right now. And the way to solve that is to force quit the pilot app and relaunch it. And sometimes you have to do it a couple times before those settings show up. DJI is aware of this and says it will be fixed in the next version. So hopefully anyone watching this in the near future won't have that problem. But if you are having the problem where these settings are not showing up, what you do on the smart controller is you push on the return button that's on the just on kind of bottom left side of the left joystick and the five-way switch on the right side, you push that to the left It'll bring up the list of running applications. You swipe up to close it. And when you exit out of that, the pilot uh, app will relaunch. Just give it a, a few seconds, let it relaunch, and then you should see these settings available to you. So kind of a little bit of a pain uh, if it's not working properly, but you can get it to function. All right, where am I here? Um, some of the other options in here we have Oh, my screen is just jumping all over the place. So ROI is region of interest. And what this can do is help eliminate some of the sky, basically. If you have a really cold sky, that can be taking up 
some of your color palette. And oftentimes you want to eliminate that so more of the color palette is being shown to you on what you're actually looking at. So when you go into there, you can have the full uh, ROI, sky excluded 33% or sky excluded 50%. So one to play around with when you're out there doing a search mission or something to be able to cut that down and have more of the color palette reserved for the ground in essence. So this can really help give you more contrast on what you're actually searching for instead of it wasting processing power and color palette on the sky. Now scene mode, this can allow you to fine tune some of the settings, uh, DDE, contrast and brightness, so that you can really dial in how you want the screen to be displayed. Now, I haven't really played around with this on a kind of a live mission, so I'm not quite sure how, what the, the perfect settings might be if I'm in a wooded area and I'm trying to find somebody, but being able to adjust these is pretty cool because it, it might help in some situations just to give you um, better detail of what you're actually looking for. And the gain control, it uh, allows you to change between a, a low gain and a high gain. And you see there it says negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit to around 1,022 Fahrenheit or 40 degrees to 302. So high, will capture a narrower temperature range with a higher sensitivity to temperature differences. Low gain does the opposite, and it captures a wider temperature range with a lower sensitivity to temperature differences. So depending on what you're looking at or looking for, you may need more or less sensitivity to temperature differences. On a typical search and rescue type flight, I probably want a higher sensitivity to temperature differences. I want there to be a, a more of a visual difference between a body and a rock or something like that. So I would go with probably a high gain uh, to try that just to see how it works. But again, you, this is one of those that you play around with and see what works best in your situation in the areas that you're flying, the missions that you're doing, just know that it's there and it's something that might be able to help improve the quality of your thermal images. Now, Auto FFC, this is, uh, FFC is a, a calibration that can take place. We generally don't really need to do it too often unless the temperature is changing or there, there's something changing about the environment conditions, but you can just turn on auto FFC and on a periodic basis, it'll just do a calibration for you. So you don't really have to think about it. I think I usually just leave that on and see how it goes. And then the last option here is sunburn protection. If you're flying during the day, you definitely want this on. Uh, that way, if you spin the camera like towards the sun, then it will kill the shutter so that it doesn't damage the thermal sensor. If you're flying at night, it doesn't matter. You're not going to get a bright enough light into the camera at night to cause sunburn on the sensor. But you do want it turned on during the daylight just in case. So that kind of covers the features of this. Now, one thing I, I do want to point out, and I thought I actually had a video of it here but one of the questions we've had is does the smart track feature work in thermal mode and the short answer is yes it actually does um, let me go over here yeah I'll just play this video So there's me, and I'm out about 55 meters, 
And you need to start the smart track while you're on the zoom camera. So this is an important point. You need to have enough light for the zoom camera to see the object. Then you select the smart track and then you can switch over to the thermal camera and it will continue to track the, the suspect, victim, whatever. Um, your object of interest, we should say. So yes, you can use the smart track while you have the thermal camera. Oh, okay. Uh, does the sunburn feature need to be on during the day, even if you're not using the thermal camera? If, if you have the H20T installed, yes, you want to have the sunburn feature turned on during the day. It's just a safety feature, but you know, if you're confident, you're never going to be pointing it at the sun. Okay, fine. That that's cool. But just in terms of a safety feature for the camera, if I've got the H20T on during the day, I want to have the sunburn feature on. I, I don't want to take the risk of burning out that sensor. Good question though. Uh, let's see here. And yeah, that is what I wanted to show you. So I know I've, I've had a lot of questions on whether or not it works with the, uh, the thermal. So yep, yes it does. It works quite well. I was actually fairly impressed. Okay, now we get into managing and working with the actual files. And for that, you need to download the DJI Thermal Analysis Tool. It is free, available on the DJI website. If you go to the H20T uh, pages, go to Downloads, you'll find the DJI Thermal Analysis Tool. And just so you know, it's only available for Windows. So there's that. Um, it'd be nice if they did a Mac version as well, because that's what I run. Huh. Can this camera be interchanged with the cameras on the Phantom or Mavic? No, this camera is large and it's heavy and they would not lift it. Um, this camera is only for the Matrice 300. It is the only aircraft that can fly it. It's a pretty big, heavy camera and it has to have the, the hardware and firmware to be able to support it. So no, you cannot interchange this camera with anything else. Okay, over to the DJI Thermal Analysis Tool. As I said, it runs on Windows. Now, I'm gonna do a live demo of using this tool. Even though I'm on a Mac, I'm using VMware. So hopefully this won't come and bite me too hard as I uh, try and make this work. But we'll just do a, a quick overview here on this screen. Over, oh, man, I hate it when my screen just jumps like that. Over on the left-hand side, you have your folders and your images. In the middle, you have your active image with whatever spot points or metering things that you have applied to it. Over on the right-hand side, you have your parameters. So this is where you're going to set a few things to make sure that you're getting the most accurate readings possible. Your relative humidity for the day. Now, by default, it was 70. Usually here, we run around 20. So I adjust my relative humidity. The emissivity, that is how much an object radiates back thermal radiation. And there's charts that you can look up that'll give you a good guideline on what to use, like aluminum versus brushed aluminum versus wood versus other objects. So depending on what you're looking at, you might need to adjust that emissivity in order to get, like I said, just more accuracy out of it. And then you have your reflected temperature being shown and it will show the metadata for there, the model, serial number, focal length, aperture, and a few other things. And then at the, at the top, there's a toolbar with some different tools on it that we can use. So I'm going to switch over to thermal analysis tool and like I said this might be a little glitchy because I'm I'm running this on VMware 
Uh, let's see, Eric's asking, how well does it perform in inclement weather, strong winds, rain for search and rescue? Okay. Um, well, let's exclude inclement weather because we're going to, you kind of defined it there. Strong winds, it performs extremely well. This is a great machine that can handle some pretty heavy duty winds, uh, upwards of 35, 40 mile an hour winds, not a problem. Rain, it is IP44 ingress protection, so it can take some decent rain falling directly on it. And um, now as far as the camera goes, it has the same specs. It's also IP44. Now the problem being, as soon as you get a drop of water on a lens, you won't see anything. It's going to completely uh, wipe, you know, uh, destroy whatever image you had because you now have water on the lens. So something to be aware of, you know, making sure that the camera is pointed more down instead of out to avoid getting water on the lens. Now, the other issue with thermal is thermal does not go through water. So in rain, thermal is a problem. Now, if it's a light mist or a light rain, you still may be able to get some imagery from it. But the heavier that water is, the worse thermal uh, cameras actually work. <clears throat> uh, JP, does the thermal camera have a DJ made core or is it the Tower 2 or Boson core? Um, it is not a FLIR core. That's what I can tell you. Who makes the core? I don't know other than not FLIR. So I don't know if it's something that DJI developed themselves or if they got from some other company, uh, but it's definitely not a, uh, a FLIR sensor. Okay, Sebastian, um, well, I haven't done anything yet. You should see kind of a gray screen here. So the first thing I'm going to do in the thermal analysis tool is add a folder or an ind individual uh, file. So this folder here, my H20T, you don't see the images, but this is the folder that contains them. So I'm just going to say select folder. And over here on the left-hand side, you now see the images that were in that folder. So if I just select one of these images, there we have the air conditioning on top of my building. And I can go down to the bottom corner here and move my little box around to center this up. So I've got my air conditioning system on top. Using this under uh, Windows is kind of a challenge here. Let's look over on the right-hand side. We have our distance, our relative humidity, which was 21%, really not going to affect much. Our emissivity of these objects is probably like 0.97, if I had to take a wild guess. And we see the model is the Zenmuse H20T, the serial number, focal length, aperture, resolution, the created date, last modified date, and the file size. Um, Sebastian, is it possible to analyze videos? No. A video does not contain radiometric data. It would make videos monstrous uh, because every frame would have to have temperature data on every pixel. So, no, you cannot analyze videos. You can only analyze photos because literally every pixel represented has its temperature data. Now. If we compare a 645.12 JPEG to a radiometric JPEG, right? Now, a typical JPEG of this size is going to be probably around 30K, right? The radiometric JPEG is about a meg. So a lot, a lot of data is stored in these images. So let's go up to the top here and we'll select the first tool, which is the spot meter. And as I drag this around, we can see different spots. It's going to be really cold down on the bottom because it's an air conditioner. It should get down somewhere around, yep, around 40 degrees. That's what I would think. And the hottest points are going to be these motors up here, probably around 95 degrees or so. And if I just want to drop a uh, spot there, now it's going to save that. Now, if I want more data, uh, more of an area, I can select this marquee tool and I'm just going to drag it around 
that whole box. So now I can see that my lowest point, oh, let me drag this back in here. I think this is one of these issues of using VMware is my mouse control is not the best on this app. So right there shows a spot where the lowest temperature is, which is 29.8 degrees, and the hottest temperature being 111.7 degrees. So this is how you would kind of build a report for somebody. If I'm going to take and provide this to the HVAC company, I'm going to have these spots on here. I'm going to have these different measurements. And then I'm going to save this so that they can then analyze that and determine, hey, that's probably something we should go out and check because it shouldn't be running that hot. Uh, to do that, we would use the, uh, the snapshot or screenshot tool. And clicking on that just allows you to save this screenshot as it sits right now at whatever zoom level and whatever palette. So if this palette isn't working for us, we want um, different palettes, we can change that after the fact here. So let me go to rainbow one. And it's completely, you know, toasted out here. And the reason being, we have this huge range of temperature. So I can start pulling this down and going, okay, don't show me so much data, right? I only want to see stuff that's maybe, you know, 60 degrees or 70 degrees or hotter. So if I pull that up, it's going to start isolating these color temperatures for me. Now, let me go over to this other image here. So this is my Jeep that's been seen in the sun for a while. And I have a handful of different measurements on it, as well as the temperature box on it. So I can see the hottest, coldest. I can see the temperature of my roof, my soft top, my hard top, my hood, and get a good idea that my Jeep should probably be in the shade instead of the sun. And let's take a look at some other ones here. Let me go back to white hot. So again, this is another view of the air conditioning. That's, I think this was another one that I had pretty well marked up. So something's weird with that saved image, but there we go. There's the original. If I need to, I can clear all the colored uh, data off here, all the measurement data, and just get down to what I actually want to measure. That door looks really hot. Sure. It is, it's 112 degrees, 120 degrees on the top of the dumpster. So hopefully you can see how this can help you to build reports or things for your customers, depending on their, their needs. So now it's starting to freak out a little bit uh, for some weird reason, and uh, it's not showing me the whole image. And again, this, from my experience, this is just a, an artifact of using VMware to run a Windows app, it's just it starts getting buggy after a few minutes. Yeah, I'm kind of losing uh, my detail, and I have to quit it and relaunch it. But hopefully, that gives you a good kind of overview of how the thermal analysis tool works, so that you can create reports. Now, on a typical you know search and rescue thing, you don't really care. You're probably not going to go back and analyze images for heat sources and things. This is going to be more for inspection work. Um, if someone has a use case where they would use the thermal analysis tool after um, a rescue mission or something, it'd be great to know that. Um, I can't think of uh, too many reasons why you would. But for inspection work, it's super handy so that you can then give this data to an engineer and they can determine if the equipment that you're looking at is running within specs or not. I think that's a really important thing. If I just use a differential tool, like an Autel Evo, Evo 2 Dual, right? it's not going to tell me how hot something is. All it's going to do is give me data on the screen that I can say, 
that part there is hotter than that over there. I can't get temperature readings from it. So for search and rescue, that's fine. I'm looking for things that are typically hotter than the surrounding environment, such as a person, right? So 90 plus degrees versus ground temperature being 50, 60, 70 degrees, a body is going to stand out. It's going to make it easier to find. But going back to that example of a power line transformer, now, if you've ever looked at one of those with a thermal camera, don't know how many of you have, they're hot. They're over 200 degrees. Well, that, what does that tell me? It, it tells me nothing. It tells an engineer nothing. It just means, yeah, that's okay. That's warm. But being able to go in here and open those images and use the measurement tools, it can tell me whether it's 200 degrees or 278.2 degrees. Well, in one case, it's operating within specifications. In another case, it's running too hot, which could mean it's getting some type of resistance inside, which could lead to a failure. And it's best to go send someone out and inspect it for debris or something else, make sure that it's working properly, main, main, do some maintenance on it, or possibly replace it before it actually fails. So there's a definitely a use case for the thermal analysis tool and it's really coming down to that inspection type work to really show what it's capable of doing and what you're looking at so hopefully that answers the why you would need the thermal analysis tool now i've given them some suggestions on ways to improve this and ways of actually generating like reports <laughs> like you can with the FLIR tools which i think is a great product and it looks pretty much identical to this it just has a feature where after I've put all this in I can hit a button and it creates a PDF that has the image in it and a breakdown of all of the temperatures so I'm hoping that DJI will continue to improve this tool and make it better and better as things progress so hopefully this gave you plenty of information about the H20T thermal features. It's a really a terrific camera. If you're local here in Colorado, I welcome you to come by and I'll show it to you. I'll put it up, uh, give you a little demo on how well it works and all the other things that that camera is capable of doing. Uh, be sure and check the link that you got. You should have a, a if you haven't got a link, you, you will get one with uh, a link to our other upcoming webinars. We do webinars every Wednesday. And as I said earlier, next Wednesday will be the inspection tools that uh, are with the H20 and H20T camera. So that's where you'll really get to see uh, a deep dive into how well that zoom works, uh, when we would use the, the wide angle camera and being able to use that for different automated purposes and create um, there's one, the smart inspection, where it will, you, you kind of frame everything with the wide angle camera. And then when you take a picture, you get that view plus the zoom camera zooms in and takes a bunch of pictures. What you end up with is a file that you can open up in a web browser, see the, the wide angle view. And when you click on a spot, it will then move to a close-up image of that and that's really handy for being able to do that and not have to create all that manually it just does it for you which is super cool so be sure and check out that webinar next week and if you're interested in lidar um, in two weeks we have rock robotic with their new lidar system that's just come out a very exciting product and in three weeks we're doing one with air data so you can see how to manage your drone's data, your maintenance plans, and your fleet, even do uh, screen sharing with other people in your organization. So Air Data is a very, very cool product. I'm very excited about it. So thanks you all for spending a little bit of your Wednesday afternoon with me. I really appreciate you guys taking your time to come to these webinars and try and learn from us as best we can teach it. I suppose I do my best, but thanks for joining everyone. Really appreciate it. 
And like I said, if you're local, come on down, give me a call. We'll schedule a time to do a demo. If you'd like more information, just uh, email us at enterprise at multicopterwarehouse.com. Let us know what area of the country you're in so it can be routed to the appropriate uh, sales rep. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.